You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with Signals of Bedlam from New York. Their new album, Liar's Intuition, is out now. It was recorded with fake Mitterito- Frank Mitterona, if I can say his name properly, who's recorded bands like Dillinger Escape Plan and The Deer Hunter. And the album was mastered by Ackle. That's right, The Ackle from Tesseract. It's a really good album. You need to go check it out now. Everyone, please welcome to The Pit, Chica Obiora and Tom Hoy from the band Signals of Bedlam. Awesome. Thanks for having us, Derek. Really great to be here. Yes, indeed. You guys like what I've done with the place? Yeah, I'm really digging the ambiance. Smells com- great. Yeah, seems comfy to me. It, please don't mind the mess. Just make some room for yourselves wherever you lean. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being on a tour at someone's house. <laughs> So before we get into the band, I'd like to get to know a little bit about you guys, just a little bit of background of yourselves as musicians. So if you could take me back, how do you guys remember falling in love with music? Maybe let's start with you, Chica. That's funny. I was going to punt it to Tom, but I'll start. Um, Yeah, music. When did I fall in love with music? I think uh, for me, it started young. You know, my dad played guitar when he was younger and he always had music going. My uncle played guitar and played in bands. And so I remember my dad had a CD collection. And when I was getting a little older, you know, maybe 12 or something, like I would go in there and pull out his CDs and listen to them. So I, like while I was doing that, I'd also been playing music or started playing music in school. So I actually started off as a drummer. When I was like in middle school, you were able to pick an instrument. And I remember saying to like my elementary school's teacher, like, drums or saxophone which do you think because I guess that was that was the kind of 10 year old I was or whatever and he was like don't play drums so I picked that one and I kind of stuck with that like through middle school high school played in concert band jazz band marching band all the the dorky things and then towards college just having I guess a musical background is when I kind of started getting into bass honestly I think it might have been from guitar I was like if I can do it here I can do it anywhere and I don't know, just always had music as just a part of my family and culture. And when I got the opportunity to play myself, it felt very easy to slip into. So for me, I I didn't really grow up in a musical house with people around me playing music. Um, I was just always kind of really really just drawn to it. I, I, as young as like four, I begged my parents to uh, let me play musical instruments. So I started playing violin when I was four. Um, Then we moved, we couldn't find a violin teacher. So I started playing cello. That was kind of my go-to instrument throughout my uh, teenage years. Um, I kind of made little forays into like guitar and bass and piano a little bit. Um, uh, In high school, got really, really into um, heavy metal during that period too. Uh, when I was in middle school, I, I remember I always loved the sound of like distorted guitars, but I didn't really know that many bands that had g- distorted guitars. So the two I knew were like the offspring and like the newer Metallica records, which were like load and reload at the time. I was like, all right, this is, I like these sounds. Um, but then I kind of, I, I heard like Master of Metallica play Master of Puppets on the radio, not live, but I heard Master of Puppets on the radio. And I was like, wow, metal? Wow, this is like different. I've never heard anything like this. And it kind of just, um, my fascination with it kind of went from there. Um, and then I made, I made kind of a detour into like acting in theater um, in Uh, Late high school, college, I was a real lonely kid and I just liked the idea of being around people. Um, But then I moved to New York to be an actor and I was just like, this sucks. I'm I'm, like depressed and I don't want to do this. Um, And my roommate had a guitar, so I just picked up a guitar and I was already kind of used to string instruments. Like the, you know, the way you have to shape your hand and the basic way you make sound is still somewhat similar. Um, And I just, yeah didn't stop from there. So when the band formed, did any of you guys know each other previously or did you all meet each other when the band formed? This band is a 100% Craigslist band. Um, I initially met the singer Sarah in 2010 
and we worked together for a little bit and then we put out a Craigslist ad and um, Chica and a friend of hers were the only real solid human respondents to that ad. So. Yeah. yeah and, and it was definitely a, a process. I know Tom and Sarah had played with other rhythm sections before like I joined and he had drummer at the time. He was with the band maybe like a couple years and then it ended up not working out. So then we were kind of, doing the drummer to hire thing for live shows for maybe like a year or so. Um, And then we connected with Rich also through the internet. And I think, so Escaping Velocity, that was, we wrote that with the drummer before Rich mostly. Rich recorded the album, but he came in when it was like half written. And then for Liar's Intuition, that's basically the first thing that we the four of us wrote together as a band. So I think that that's a testament to the power of the internet. Of course, of course. And do you remember, Tom, when you guys put out that original Craigslist ad, what, what do you remember writing down on it? I, 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 I have no idea. Um, the only thing I remember when... Uh, I, I mentioned like the ad was the very first time, but we had kind of like, I don't know, there were these two guys that kind of flaked on us. We worked with for like a couple months and that didn't really work out. And then we, we were just getting no luck getting like solid responses until Sarah one day, just I walked into rehearsal and he's like, hey, I basically wrote all the parts for the record uh, except your guitar on the computer. So we have a full fledged demo. And I was like, awesome. That's so cool. Um, And so I was just excited, like, wow, we have an actual piece of music. Maybe we can actually get, like, real consistent players who are excited about what we're doing. And that was No Gods, No Monsters? No, that was a three-song demo. It had three songs off of No Gods, No Monsters on it. But, yeah, less expansive, kind of like computerized drums. Um it was just a self-titled. We were called From Below at the time. So we just, yeah. Okay. And so that's where the song Blood Money comes from, is with From Below? Yeah, yeah. When That, that was our band name at the time. Um, that wasn't on that demo. That was something that uh, um, got, uh, got written once Chica and our old drummer Ian showed up. Um, it was actually that song is really cool because I remember that's one of the first times when Sarah and I had kind of like written that song. Uh, that was the first time like Chica had put like a creative stamp on a song because all of a sudden she started doing this um, three on two rhythm through this one like transition part. And it just gave it this really off kilter, like weird kind of feel because it's this like bouncy bluesy thing. And then all of a sudden it's like you get totally get thrown through a loop. So I was like, wow, this is weird and really fun and kind of novel sounding. And I really dug it. So from the early days when the band formed, was it already known to you guys that you wanted to do something that, I mean, for a lack of a better term, I think of your band as being an activist band and uh, politically conscious and putting that into the lyrics and just making political statements in the music is that something that you guys all knew that you wanted to do from the beginning or is it something that just kind of evolved? Well, I'll speak to that first and I, I, I'd like to hear Chica expound upon it a little bit, but uh, Sarah and I are both, uh, both have like pretty, uh, pretty strong political views and we'd always admired music that did that and had that kind of messaging um, and just, you know, feeling the way we do and being artists, we just knew that was something that we, had to have be a part of this that we really wanted to have be a part of this so it was part it was something we discussed at our very first meeting that this was going to be part of the project's dna yeah and i think to add to that sarah is the one who writes the lyrics but i don't think that there's anything in the lyrics that every individual member like doesn't feel in some certain way so i think that there's I, I guess in the approach, the idea of speaking to people who 
maybe don't have a voice or who don't have a way of expressing themselves or who are unique or different. I think that that's something that we all feel supportive of. Uh, and, and that voice comes through, not just in the lyrics, but I feel like it comes through even musically where we're not adhering to a certain like style where we kind of just follow our whims a little bit. And it can be uh, challenging to write in that way. But when you're not afraid to try something that doesn't feel like it belongs, but it's something that you feel that you want to do, that you want to try, you, you make it work. So I think that it's definitely been an interesting the result has been really interesting. And I think we all, like the four of us now, get along very well musically, even though it's painful sometimes writing or even like socially or politically, like we have plenty of ground in common. And so I think that that's just been something that's very fortuitous. Maybe a reason that we've been able to work together for so long in, you know, different iterations, but generally like this band has existed in some form for like close to a decade. So that might be why. It seems like a, it, like a, for a lot of musicians, obviously you, you have things that you want to accomplish musically, but having this extra part on top of it where it's like you can also accomplish something by, you know, putting out your ideas and trying to, you know, make the world around you a better place. Uh, is that just kind of like extra fuel to the fire, do you think? I... I think so. I, and I, I don't want to speak for Tom or, or anyone else, but yeah, I think that there's this feeling that whatever our contribution is to the band or to the music, it feels like something that we have to do. You know, there's some internal drive to do this thing at the expense of maybe other things in your life that you might want to do. Um, and, and maybe that is part of it, I guess, just that that drive to I have these things that I want to present to other people. And this is the particular vehicle that we have, music. Some people have art. Some people um, are, are able to give speeches or to organize groups. But this is something that we can do. And I think that that is something that we stick to. I don't know if you have anything to say, Tom. Yeah, I, I know. I've just been thinking about that. It's kind of... Um, kind of a, I don't know, it, that, that question just has my, my brain go in a lot of different directions. I'm going to answer maybe not directly, but a little parallel to it, I suppose. Um, I mean, for me, being an artist and playing music like this is, I, I don't know if I can like separate the two in a way. Because, you know, if you're going to, you know, I'm doing some kind of self, self-expression self to communicate, you know, with the idea of communicating an idea using a medium other than like words that I'm speaking through now using sound. You know, and when I, and when you, when I want to like create when you create something, it's, it's not necessarily like, oh, I'm going to choose to put this or that kind of thing in it. It's, you know, this is me and this is how I reflect what I see of the world with the values that I have with the way I see thing, you know, see things working. So I, I don't know. I, I don't think I can, I don't think I can separate like the art and the activism necessarily, at least not with this band. Um, at least not with something I'm personally invested in. It's always going to be, I don't know, something, something of an issue. So uh, it does make sense. It does make sense. Uh, the next question is a lot more straightforward. Just simply, how did you guys come up with the band name? It sounded cool. Um, it, it does sound cool. <laughs> well, I, I, honestly, the conversation started with our old name from below um, was just not very Googleable. And if you're like an up and coming band, you need to be able to put your name into Google and have you be the first result. Um, and so it didn't fit the bill. So like we need a new name. And then I think Sarah came up with Signals of Bedlam and we're like, oh, yeah, that sounds appropriate. 
it's like the me if you parse out the meaning it's kind of there um and it sounds like uh it's it sounds like the kind of band we are so as, as cynical as it is a lot of it was just a, kind of a i don't know a marketing decision not exclusively, but that was definitely a part of it. <laughs> that was definitely a part of it. And we had a bunch of other names, none of which I can remember now, but that's probably why we didn't use any of them. Um, but yeah, it was. I think finally Sarah was like, Signals of Bedlam. And we, we had a meaning that worked for it, where it's like, you know, Bedlam, noise, something that is signaling noise and, and other meanings that a person might want to read into it. And then also... The icing on the cake is that if you Google signals of Bedlam were the first results. So, and then moving forward with that, so uh, making no gods, no monsters. That was really uh, Tom and Sarah. You guys working together, and then it, did it kind of get more inclusive after that? Yeah, I, I'd say so. Um, a lot of the song, like the base level songwriting, was kind of done. Um, now, I mean, when you're in a band, it's so it's like, oh, when you when some when like you write this song before another musician has put their stamp on it, the song's still not done though. So you know, we we still we had like sketches and ideas and everything, um, and a lot of things like structured out. But yeah, so we we kind of took care of like that component of band songwriting on that record. Right, and then it was a different approach when you guys went into the studio for escaping velocity. Yeah. I, th I think, I think by the time, so there are no gods, no monsters. Like, like I, when I joined, most of the songs were like the sketches were there. And so you're still trying to feel everyone out. I think I had been playing with Tom and Sarah for quite a bit once we got ready for escaping velocity. And so it was more, you know, I was able to introduce song structures and that I brought in my, you know, history, my vocabulary. And I think the individually, we all have like different tastes, but we have like some, we have enough middle ground that we can play in that space of bands that we like and music that we like, but also bring in our individual elements. Right? So I think by Escaping Velocity, it was less, you know, here are the, like when you're a guitarist, you, you have a certain way of writing a song because you can hold down a song by yourself technically. Like you can take a, a guitar and sing in front of a campfire and that's good. But when you're introducing song structures, at least for me as a bass player or when like drum grooves are becoming the core of parts, it, I think it just naturally changes the flavor of the songs that come out. And I think that is part of what makes escaping velocity and, and even into liars intuition start to sound so different is because we each had uh more a bigger piece of the pie i think to start to like interject our individual personalities also um a big part of moving into escaping velocity was we just knew we wanted to be a little more painstaking with recording it um uh, and knowing that we wrote music that demanded a more painstaking approach. Uh, no Gods, No Monsters definitely is more, there's definitely a, a, a significant garage rocky kind of vibe through a lot of it. And our new tunes didn't have that quite as much. Uh, they, they, you know, they were like, we just played differently, period. Um, and it really necessitated really going over the songs with a fine tooth comb and really like getting uh, and being with a serious studio. Um, and also we didn't really think this through at the time either, but uh, bringing, uh, bringing Frank in on that record too, which we, we were just like, oh, this guy seems like a good engineer. He'll record as well. But he just kept like adding things that were really valuable. Um, you know, he's a guy that really loved and I think loved and appreciated the style of music that we played too. So he, he was a, he was a definite addition and a surprising, but very valuable addition to that record. So recording with Frank again, with Liar's Intuition, was that just a no brainer? I would yeah. say so. Kinda. Yeah. We just established a really good rapport on the first record and it was just, you know, 
And, and inviting someone in to be an, a creative editor in your process is a really big show of trust too. Um, Definitely. So, and there was, it was trust that, you know, Frank had already earned and maybe, you know, maybe if we had like money to burn to go around and hire some, some guy or try out different studios and everything like that, maybe, I don't know. It was, yeah, it was a no brainer. Basically Frank was there and we, we really liked working with him. Yeah. I, I was just, I was just going to add, uh, I think, you know, having a producer, I think even, you know, metal is not a genre that a lot of, that the majority of people like it's, it's, you know, lots of people, millions upon millions enjoy metal. But if, if you look at like compared to the amount of people that listen to music on Spotify, it's still like a small subset. And then even within there, like progressive metal is a small subset of metal. And I think one thing that became more clear for us is that we're always better served, like working with people who have the same love of the, the style that you do. And so specifically, like just, you know, with Frank, like loving the style of music that we play, having worked with other bands that we also enjoy, and just being able to input like a critical perspective a critical outside perspective i think is really really important when you're spending months crafting songs you lose perspective and having somebody who has an affinity of for the genre but also you have a good relationship with who can be that extra band member essentially in terms of the input when they're asking you to try something that you wouldn't normally try or being real with you and saying that listen that thing that you think is cool is not working I think that's really invaluable. And we got that with Frank. And you guys said too, in another interview that with the making of liars intuition, you spent about a better part of a year doing twice weekly sessions between all of you. So that must've been really important to just getting into the room together, hashing out all the ideas together. So when you did that and going through that process, I know what that's like. Did when you got to the studio, was it like you were 90, 90% complete? Did you kind of leave room because you knew Frank was going to have input? Or did you try to just finish everything as best you could before you got it there? Uh, I would say both things are true. <laughs> you know, there's... We, we got the songs to as really as far as we could. Um, it, some of the process was also kind of dictated by, it's like, man, we've been writing this for a long time. We just need to like, let, let, let's pick a day and get the songs done at this point um, by, by a certain point. And so then, then the way we write songs is, you know, it's, it's a painstaking, very detail oriented and collaborative process, which all those, all those factors kind of feed into each other. Um and so, yeah, sometimes when we came right down to it, it was kind of like, this is a decision we can make in the studio and involve Frank. Let's move on for the time being. But um, but yeah, everything, I mean, it's hard to say we didn't, it wasn't painstaking or we didn't go through everything because I mean, the process in itself is going through things with like a fine tooth comb. So like so often, so. And, and I should also like, you know, adding to that, different things got done at different times. So for me, like as a rhythm section player, the structure of the song for me didn't change much for maybe the couple months leading up until when we recorded. Same thing with the drums. You know, different fills might have come out in the studio than what maybe Rich had been working with in rehearsals, but the structure of the song was generally set. And then just in our sort of order of operations, the things that come a little bit later are the vocals and like lead guitar. And so I think those were definitely two of the things that were refined in the studio or written in the studio or like in between sessions, just because that's when Frank is there and saying, hey, try this or you could do this. And then that really... And it's interesting because the stuff that like maybe I might have been playing similarly for a few months, like leading up to our like sessions, once you hear the vocals like 
in full color or like the lead guitar in full color it does like totally change the sound of the song so that was something that was interesting for me just to like watch and be like oh wow this is not even what i expected would happen cool Right. I, I, there's something that happens when you guys are playing all in the same room together and trying to hear it that way. And then when you finally hear all these parts taken apart in the studio and now you have like fresh ears hearing your own song again. I think that's part of the reason why I like the album so much, though, is that you guys did spend so much time in the room together. It sounds like a band playing, not just separate musicians that came together and put their stuff together. Do you get what I mean? Yeah, yeah, and that's always been something that's been really, really important to us, to to sound like, you know, because we, we played a lot in New York City, and you're playing, like, dive bars, you're playing, like, with maybe not bands that would be, like, considered genre appropriate, um, and so one thing that was always a, a big driving principle is that we want this to sound, like, exciting, like, we want this to be, if you were in a random bar in the basement, trying to check out what's happening like this band would be there putting on a good show and sounding exciting and so I think even in the writing it was always I think we love layers and and sounds and I think something to definitely experiment with in the studio but I think a just a principle is that we want to sound like we're we're playing together on a stage and I think that that definitely pulled us in a certain direction while writing. It's just our natural inclination. And we did write it together. So there is that as well. Yeah, I think, you know, when, when you're, when your songs are like tried and tested over literally years playing through them in a room together, I think there's just a certain energy that comes off of them that way. If you're, if that's, you know, if, if you're going back and editing and writing based on, what you're hearing all around you all the time things that informs your writing process because that's how you work through things that's how you know that's what you base trial your all of your trial and error and things like that on um which uh yeah yeah so um and also yeah just to echo what chica said i have a kind of I have a ba- I have a musical pet peeve with bands I listen to and it, it's it's and it's just the way things get recorded with some things that it's just like if it sounds like overly processed or it was like strictly done in a studio it tends to be I don't know it can really suck the life out of it real fast and not be not be very fun um I say this as a diehard Nine Inch Nails fan and know that like Reznor is a studio wizard and everything. So I'm not completely, I'm not <laughs> completely anti that approach by any means, but there's, it, it has to have some of that. It has to have that energy. Otherwise it's like, what are you doing? Why isn't a computer doing this? You, you know? So. I, I, I think of that feeling I get that adrenaline rush or whatever when I get from your music and it makes me think of Rage Against the Machine and I thought that was funny because I was looking at one of you guys' interviews and you were asked what's your favorite song, video, or lyrics quote by another act or artist that best exemplifies or at least partly relates to your current viewpoint and you guys said Rage Against the Machine Sleep Now in the Fire and I was like fuck yeah (laughs) (laughs) they shut down Wall Street for a day it's like, a great music video. It is. And just to know that there's bands out there that still have that same kind of passion and drive to really just make a big fucking impact. Like, that's really cool. Yeah. I mean, they were, I've always loved Rage Against the Machine. They're one of my favorite bands. Um, seeing them, honestly, well, before I moved to New York City, um, when I was 22, I went to Lollapalooza in 2008 and managed to see Rage Against the Machine live. Um, and when I was just kind of like, just depressed and bumming around and I was just like, man, music really, really makes me happy. And I thought about that show an awful lot. It was definitely a big, when Sarah and I first met each other and first grabbed a beer together, it was like, it was a big bonding point too, that we both absolutely loved Rage Against the Machine. I think it's easy though for bands uh, when they like with Rage, they obviously split up. System of a Down is having a hard time getting back in the studio with Surge. I think it's easy for bands to just get lost in the minutiae of certain things and just 
holding on to the bigger picture of why you're doing what you're doing coming together. I think that's what's going to really hold you guys together going forward. And what do you guys see for yourselves on the horizon? Well, I think that one of the benefits of having, well, okay. So I'll say with, with writing an album and then all of the pain, I won't say pain, but there was definitely discomfort because when you have people who are this, that passionate and you're all trying to do something together, like you're going to have to work through things and that, that can be challenging. But I think the benefit of having this sort of forced space, at least for me, is that it gives you space from the thing that you did to look at it and say, Hey, actually, you know what? Like we're onto something here still, like it's still working. And I think the, the year has, has forced us to take like different approaches to things. Um, like we used to be very much a live, you know, band playing as much as we could. And you just do that because that's the thing that you do. But then you realize, hey, maybe, you know, we, this isn't the most, like, the only way to go about things. And the year has kind of, we've taken a step back and focused more on, like, social media and, like, doing stuff you know, remotely. And I don't know, for me, that's been really interesting just to imagine a new way of doing things and just to see like what happens. Things are maybe opening up again this year, you know, so we've talked about getting like some touring together, if not this year, maybe next year, um, trying to figure out different ways of getting new ideas together again. So it's, I think like ever, for everyone this year has been a lot of change, but when you have something that manages to hold on through the change, you know, we've as a band still been active in this new way. I don't know. It kind of makes you think, well, if it was resilient against, you know, that, like what else can we do? So that's probably like a, a vague non-answer, but I'm personally just open to see, you know, how, th- what happens? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At, at the, when we were done with escaping velocity, I, I had no idea what form the next record would, would take at all. And turns out it's this, <laughs> I don't think this was something we, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think this was something we really like calculated or thought out. It was just, what happened when the four of us wrote a record? I don't know how the hell it happened. And really I don't. Um, We just, we just made a commitment to get this thing done. And the results that we were playing and coming up with were always worth it. Um, So I think the next record will probably be very much the same. Um, I think a lot of what anchors it is uh, commonality of, perspective on the world and politics, like we talked about before, commonality of music too, which I think sometimes we're, we're even stronger as a band just because we're not all in love with the same things. Like we have, a, there's a lot of things in common we love, but there's a lot of things we don't. Like we have, all of us have favorite bands that the other person's like, it's cool, but you know, nice. <laughs> um, and so yeah, I feel like we're we're able to like bring fresh ideas and fresh ears to each other to each other's work. Um and I also I mean any any uh relationship of any kind of length that's fundamentally like built on trust too. And you know, we've all known each other for a while and I really the foundation of this band is that we're 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 friends. Like we all get along well together. We all respect each other. So that's, that's somewhat of a non-answer towards your question, but it really is like foundational to the artistic process and where we're going to go. And it's like, where are we going to go? I don't know. We'll figure it out together. We've come this far. I think it's really special that you guys would consider yourselves friends now and to know that you, you didn't have a past relationship coming into the band. You've all known each other as band members. So to to see that you've gone through all that you've gone through with as few lineup changes as you've had 
I think that's what you're getting as that you now have a, a established trust and respect for each other and you want to bring in more influences and hear what each other have been listening to even if it's not what you're into you just you want to play music together <laughs> yeah exactly and it's not like it's oh it's not what I'm into like oh that sucks man I would never listen to that it's it's usually like well I'm not that's cool I'm not going to play that on repeat like you are but that's still cool Although I do remember a time I we used to when we would play shows out of town, like we would all just kind of pile into like one Jeep together. And I do remember like passing around the, the iPod or whatever we had. And, you know, some people would play their tracks and, you know, the response would be somebody else turning down the volume just subtly. And you're like, all right, <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll do less of that. But <laughs> it, it is it is funny, I think. I think. Tom's right. I think we just also enjoy one another's company. And so it's sort of like, well, you know, something will happen. Uh, this is a staple question that I just kind of always ask people. What advice would you give to anyone who's trying to achieve their dreams? I don't know. What what advice would I give myself for trying to achieve my dreams? I mean, I, I, I think you just keep at it and and that sounds kind of stupid maybe but i'm a firm believer i guess that the energy that you you put out into the world is what you get back and so if you stick with what it is that you believe in and what you want to do and you put out good energy and you're cool with people like don't be a jerk put yourself out there stick at it something will happen if you have expectations of We'll, we'll talk music because that's what we're, we're here about. If you have expectations, like I'm going to play Madison Square Garden and I'm not a success unless that happens. Well, okay, you might be setting yourself up for some just mental tension if you can't reach that. But if you just like, you know, focus on the thing that you want to do and just do that to the best of your ability, put out good energy, don't be a jerk, something good will happen. And, you know, I just think that that's a a principle that people should adhere to where, you know, don't set a, a, some target on your dream that makes your dream feel bad while you're actually doing it. Like we're actually talking to somebody who wants to interview us about our music that we wrote in our like smelly rehearsal studio. To me, that is successful, right? Just because we, and we're doing something that we enjoy. So I guess that's my advice is, you know, just do what you enjoy, put out good energy and people will respond. I would say in in a, first off, in a practical sense, um, well, actually first, I'm going to lead with this. First off, whatever you choose to do, you need to pick something that gives back to you. So you need to pick something that's like gratifying to you or gives or like is, is satisfying to you in some kind of fundamental way. Um, Because otherwise you're not going to like, if you're, if, if you're doing, if you're going to throw yourself into something for something that doesn't like build you up, make you a better person, um, uh, you're not, you're just not going to last very long and it's not going to be very much fun. So pick some, do something that gives back to you. Um, on a practical sense, I, I can't really overstate how much being dedicated and disciplined like day in and day out is and how satisfying it really is too. um, The first like year I played guitar, I was, again, I was still working like sad restaurant jobs and pretty much doing like blowing all my money on alcohol and weed. And I was just not a great, I was, was not in a great place, but, um, it really, it did wonders for me getting really disciplined about guitar practice. It's like, no, I'm going to come home and I'm going to practice guitar like three hours, four hours, even up to five hours a day, every day. Um, I ended up taking days off so I didn't injure my hand or wrist, (laughs) Um, but yeah, being, being like dedicated day in and day out to something and having that be something that gives back to you is 
really, I mean, th those are those are the two biggest ones. And you need to be able to listen to what the world's telling you about things enough to be flexible. Like, the I I still I believe that you know the right the getting into the right activities or whatever it is. Um, the, the world tells you when you're on the right track or not in a way it's either like you find this really fun or, you know, you get some burst of momentum from, you know, other people really, really liking it. Um, or, or, you know, something you just have to listen to the, listen to the world and yourself about it. And lastly, you have to market your, this is like so shitty and I hate saying this. Um, but you, no one else is going to market you. You have to market yourself. You have to be your own biggest fan and go out and push your own product and don't feel like an asshole for doing it. Like go out and relentlessly be your biggest fan. But, you know, with the caveat of what Chica said, don't be a jerk to people either. <laughs> You've been listening to the Peach Pit. I've been here talking with Tom and Chica from the band Signals of Bedlam. Please go check out their new album, Liar's Intuition, as it's out now, and it's really good. Tom, Chica, thanks for taking time to talk to me, and hopefully we'll do it again in the future. Awesome. I'd like that. Thanks for having us, Derek. Really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Pleasure is all mine. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too.